I'm Yolanda Sonier, the Administrator for the Office of Human Rights and Equity here in Howard County. The Office of Human Rights and Equity investigates complaints of, of discrimination in Howard County, as well as works towards eradicating discrimination, increasing and promoting equal opportunity, and furthering equity and human rights protections for all. If you need the assistance of the office, please reach out to us. If you want to partner with the office, please reach out to us. You can reach us at 410-313-6430, or you can email us at ohre at howardcountymd.gov. International Human Rights Day is observed every year on December 10th which is the day in 1948 the United Nations General Assembly adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, also known as the UDHR. The UDHR proclaims the inalienable rights that everyone is entitled to as a human being, regardless of how you look, your status, or how you identify. The UDHR is available in more than 500 languages, and it is considered to be the most translated document in the world. Each year, the UN develops a theme for International Human Rights Day. This year's theme is Equality, Reducing Inequalities, Advancing Human Rights. This year's Human Rights Day theme relates to equality in Article 1 of the UDHR. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. This theme alone is something we can probably unpack for hours, days, probably years. Um, but today we only have a limited time with you and we have an awesome esteemed panel of human rights advocates that I want you to hear from. Well, thank you, Yolanda, for having me. I'm Dr. Maura Rossman. I am the health officer for Howard County Health Department. I'm a pediatrician and have been in public health for almost 25 years, uh, almost 15 of which have been in with the Howard County Health Department. Good afternoon. My name is Rich Gibson, state's attorney for Howard County. I've been a prosecutor for 17 years. Uh, was elected into office in 2018, took office in 2019. It's my honor to serve this community. Hello, I'm Kiana Folk. I'm the I'm the PFLAG secretary of their steering committee and a active community member throughout Howard County. Thank you. And each of you come from different sectors of our community, which I think is going to make our conversation even more impactful. And I just want to just kind of throw one, you know, just a Simple question, because everyone thinks of human rights, but they don't really look and think of what the definition is, and everyone has their own interpretation of what it is. When you hear of human rights, um, State's Attorney Gibson, can you share with us what do you think of? When I think of human rights, what I think of is just rights that are, that are given to and should be guaranteed for people simply for existing. So just the, the fact that they exist, regardless of demographic difference, imbues them with certain rights that we should recognize as a society. Dr. Rossman, do you want to jump in as well and answer that question about what you believe human rights are? Yes, absolutely. And I don't think it's such a simple question. I think it's quite complex um, and a great uh, discussion item for mm -hmm. us to start with. So for, as a healthcare professional, um, I see human rights as the ability for everyone to have equal access to affordable, quality, uh, accessible health care. And I loved your definition that you just stated that everyone born has the opportunity basically to thrive uh, regardless of age, de gender, sex, sexual orientation, ethnicity, and race. Thank you for that. And Kiana, I want to bring you in as well because your definition may be different. What do you think of when you hear human rights? I actually do agree with, I do, do agree about the accessibility to like healthcare, for example, uh, guaranteed jobs and being someone also, who's also on the autism spectrum as well as a access to, like easier access to jobs, especially trying to get through the interview process. Um, 
and just being accepted for like um for being who you are so. thank you for that and that's an interesting perspective that you said about job interviews mm -hmm. because some people don't recognize that some people have had jobs for years and don't even stop to think that just basically going into a job interview and the people that are interviewing you mm -hmm. may be something that um, people should consider and think about. So thank you yeah. for bringing that point up. Mm -hmm. Now when I introduced each of you, I said that you were human rights advocates. Do you see yourself in your field as human rights advocates? And if yes, tell us why. And if not, tell us why not. Uh, first as a, a pediatrician, I hope um, that every pediatrician is advocating for every pregnant mom and every baby that's born. Uh, that that initial of, oh my goodness, when, when you see your baby uh, or grandchild for the first time and the dreams and aspirations that you have for that child, that that child uh, has the ability uh, to develop those dreams uh, equally among every, every child uh, born. Um, and uh, I'll say as a public health professional, it's really important that uh, every public health um, employee and official, I think, be a human rights advocate because without human rights and equity, we will never achieve uh, population health goals. From, from my perspective as a prosecutor, uh, I look at it as my principal focus is, is safeguarding public safety in this space, ensuring that everyone can move about and be where they work, live, play, mm -hmm. in Howard County in particular, but in the state of Maryland as well, uh, safely, and, and protecting those rights, regardless of what their backgrounds are, regardless of what uh, demographic differences there are, having a safe space for all, and equal justice, and equal access to justice for all people who are in our space. I see myself as one so. Um, in particular, I guess I could say like trying to get have like as mentioned the first part about better access such as to food to health and for example like um, if there is like lack of being able to afford food at supermarkets they could like perhaps have like more obviously for like um, an awareness to do like community gardening or perhaps more awareness of other groups and their issues and ways they can um, stand up for them and have um, leaders be aware of what's going on to have actual um, positive community change. Thank you. And I'm glad that each of you identify yourselves as human rights advocates because most definitely I do. And that was one of the reasons why we invited you. You know, a lot of people think of a human rights advocate, someone that's out there protesting or you know, that it, the person looks or talks a certain way, and that's not the case. I see each and every one of you in the community advocating for, you know, whether or not it's the food desert and making sure that there's protections and that there's equal access to food. I see um, State's Attorney Gibson as well as Dr. Rossman in the community advocating in different ways, so thank you for that. I have a couple follow-up questions, though, based upon how you identify um, as a human rights advocate. So Dr. Rossman, and I say this with fingers crossed, hopefully we're at the tail end of a global pandemic. Um, maybe that's wishful thinking, but some consider COVID-19 a human rights issue. Do you see it as such? And if so, what way do you see that people's human rights as part of COVID, the vaccine, do you see how people's rights have been violated or how people have indicated to you that their rights have been violated as as having access to the vaccine. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and sure, I, I certainly uh, hope we're at the tail end, but um, the story is evolving. I know, as fingers we, crossed. Yes, as we all <laughs> just heard about the latest variant. Yes. Um, but certainly with vaccine availability, we are in a far better place, uh, in my opinion, than we, than we were a year ago. Um, and vaccines at this point, in my uh, professional opinion, are the um, strongest uh, strategy to get to that final end game. So access to vaccine is, is critical for everyone. Um, I think what is happening right now with the latest uh, variant 
is uh, that uh, we know viruses like to replicate. That's what they do. And they do it well in populations where people are largely unvaccinated. And in certain countries like Africa, there's a much lower vaccination rate than uh, here in the United States. Um, so the more people that get vaccinated globally, the better for everyone. The initial aspects of uh, the pandemic, I think we all heard about um, uh, equity issues regarding who was getting sick. Right. And we saw our communities of color being uh, disproportionately affected. I think that had to do with uh, where people work. Uh, white collar workers were able to remote work, uh, stay safe in their homes and um, persons that uh, needed to go hourly jobs um, to put food on the table and keep the roof over their head did not have that ability to stay at home. Um, and we saw our communities of color, again, more hospitalizations and deaths um, initially. Uh, I think that all evened out over time and, and, and certainly in Howard County, we all collectively worked hard to make sure that our uh, our any equities that we were seeing um, could be resolved in any way we did. Um, and vaccination rates, I'll have to say, are pretty even across the board based on population. The interesting conversation now that I hear from a human rights issue are about mask mandates and people being required to be vaccinated. And it's um, actually the person saying, you know, I don't want to be vaccinated or be forced to vaccinate as they're saying that's a human rights issue versus in the beginning sort of those being exposed. Uh, and, and so I find that at the very least an interesting debate that we are having in this country. Um, I don't have the answers for it, I do have opinions, but um, I think we have a number of unresolved issues that the pandemic has sort of bubbled to the top. And I'm hopeful that uh, with this bubbling up of issues brought forth by the pandemic, that will allow us to have deeper conversations about human rights, equity, racism, to move us forward. Um, one of the things I find with COVID was that it bubbled to the surface of the inequities with healthcare. And so not just with the COVID vaccines, not only with you know people's ability to stay home, but just general healthcare. And I know that that has been a discussion amongst marginalized communities as well as the healthcare field. And so if you can talk about some um, innovative steps that the Howard County Health Department is doing to make sure um, that the healthcare is accessible and available to all. Yeah, I'm right. We, we need to have all have access, as I said in the beginning, to what I consider quality, affordable, accessible uh, healthcare for going to reach our whatever potential. Um, so um, from a, I'll give you an example of what we did during the pandemic, which it just is an example of, we know that there are some people that it's easier to get to your appointment than others for transportation reasons, for the fact maybe you work at home and you can take that hour um, uh, during the day or whatever time it is for your appointment, or you're, you're working only one job versus three jobs. Um, so, in general, most people in Howard County can get to where they need to get to. But we certainly know that there's um, communities and also individuals who, who don't have, I'm going to say, either that luxury or that ability. So during um, when the vaccine was critical, we have to vaccinate everyone. So we partnered, um, and the health department runs fabulous large clinics. You come to our clinic, we'll vaccinate you. Um, but we knew that some people couldn't get to us for disability reasons, mobility reasons, other reasons. And so we partnered with the Mobile Integrated Health Team with the Department of Fire and Rescue. We brought vaccinations to people and continue to do so. Um, and delivering health care in mobile ways. Mm -hmm. Telehealth really grew a lot during the pandemic. And so trying to get people with technology gaps uh, you need a cell phone or you need something to be able to use a telehealth platform um, was something again we work on and we are able to distribute actually cell phones to our Medicaid recipients to make sure that they have an, a way to communicate with their provider uh, if they want to use telehealth they're able to do that they need to make appointments do that as well so those are just two examples I would say that uh, 
uh, that we've done during the pandemic um, and um, we'll continue to evolve um, when for more traditional health care models. Thank you. Those are two, it may be two ways, but they're two amazing, extraordinary ways of reaching people. So people that could not come out of, out of their home, I saw, you know, the health department going out um, with the fire department's mobile team to get them vaccinated. And that says, um, that says a lot. So thank you. I want to pivot and go to you, um, State Attorney Gibson. So also during this COVID pandemic, we also saw another pandemic going on. We saw the call for social change. We saw the murder of George Floyd. We saw instances of police brutality that was going on. And so one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about is police brutality has been a major concern, not just recently, for many years amongst the marginalized community, amongst brown and black um, individuals in our community. I know that County Executive Ball recently signed a budget amendment um, in order to fund body-worn cameras for the police department. How does body-worn cameras promote human rights? How does it protect people in the community and how is your office involved in that endeavor? Absolutely. Um, so first off, body-worn camera is not a panacea. It's not a magical solution. What it does do is it provides a mechanism for, for memorializing or recording an interaction between law enforcement and a community, or someone in our community. And that recording, if properly maintained and done, um, allows for accountability of action, right? So if an officer engages in misconduct, there's a record of it and it can be held accountable. If a member of our community or someone in our community engages in misconduct, there's a record of it and they can be held accountable. So what Body One Camera does is it preserves the truth of the interaction and that allows accountability to flow for wrongdoing if it occurred within that interaction. Um, in terms of what my office has done, I've always been a proponent of Body One Camera. Um, since being sworn into office, I've been an advocate for it. I testified in Annapolis in order to make, statewide we had law passed that body one cameras may be required for many jurisdictions by 2023, the, the remainder of the state by 2025. Uh, I played a role in helping to shape that um, in Annapolis by being a voice on this issue. Um, locally, I testified before the county council numerous times in order for us to get proper funding. A lot of people look at body one camera and think of it as a police thing. The reality is the reviewing entity, which is the state attorney's office, is, is very involved in body one camera in the maintenance of it, in the review of it, the analysis of it. Again, that accountability measure happens through our office and through the courts. And then storage, we have to hold it for a period of time. And so there's a lot of moving parts as it relates to this tool that we intend to use to preserve the truth of these interactions. And I am now, after lobbying the county council and getting the appropriate funding to roll out a program effectively, because if it's not rolled out effectively, it's of no moment. It doesn't serve the community's purpose. We acquired the right resources to roll it out effectively, and now we're in the process of acquiring the pieces, the people, the technology, the equipment, to properly implement it for the community. So you made an interesting point that I think a lot of people don't think of, that the state's attorney's office is the one that is implementing this, that is viewing the footage. I've heard people say, well, the police department, they're gonna look at it and they're gonna erase whatever is there. And so thank you for pointing that out so people are aware of how um, the program actually works. Now, when people, and I've heard this in several different forms about the state's attorney's office, and that the state's attorney's office um, is not for the marginalized community, is actually against. And so can you talk about how your office seeks to secure equal justice amongst all people within the county. Absolutely. It's a, it's a, I want to dispel that myth right now. It is a paramount concern that we provide equity in access to justice, equal treatment for all people, regardless of their, their demographic differences, right? Uh, gay, straight, male, female, 
whatever your race, whatever your religion, is of no moment. You should have equal access and fair access to the justice system. You have the right to be safe in your space, in your community. Um, and that's safe from others in the community and safe from those enforcing the law. So safe from the police as well, ensuring that when they interact with you, they interact with you in a just way, right? So safety is a global thing. Um, and, and we are absolutely focused on that. We have implemented under my, um, once, since I've been in power, we've implemented several uh, intercession points as it relates to creating a more equitable justice for this community. Um, one thing that we've done is we brought on uh, Dr. Russell McLean, or uh, Professor Russell McLean actually, from University of Maryland as an expert in implicit bias. Mm -hmm. We wanted to make sure that we had training crafted for our sphere. It's implicit bias training, or any training for that matter, if it's generic, it's not gonna, it's not gonna speak to your issues unique in your space. The training for implicit bias for medical professionals is gonna be different than the training for implicit bias for prosecutors or legal professionals. And so we had Dr. Uh, Professor McLean, who's an expert in that arena, craft a training program that was mandatory for my office, all right? Um, we have put in place different programs, like the Law Enforcement Assistant Diversion Program, right, uh, which, which is done in conjunction with Dr. Mara Rossman and her office, as well as the county executive, the sheriff, the police force. It was a collaborative effort um, spearheaded in our office, but it's, it's, a, it's a collaborative effort, and it wouldn't be possible without all these different agencies coming together, but it provides an alternative to the traditional justice system. So we're taking some individuals out of the justice system completely, matching them with services that address their root causes for de minimis crimes that they're committing to try to avoid them from being saddled with the collateral consequences that come with conviction. We've also implemented a restorative justice program in our office, again, an alternative to traditional justice system. The traditional justice system works, and I believe in it, but it's not a perfect tool. You need alternatives in place to speak to, the, to those situations that really don't best fit in that model, right? And we've created a space for that here in Howard County. Um, additionally, uh, in hiring, as mentioned uh, by my colleague, um, I will always seek out and hire the best personnel, regardless of their demographic background. But when I took office, what was patently obvious when I got into the office is that the office's makeup did not match the demographics of the community that we served, not even close, all right? And so what occurred is, without doing anything drastic, when there were opportunities to hire people, we kept diversity at the forefront of our mind. Again, we picked the best person regardless of whatever their background is, but we are aware of the spaces that we weren't speaking in, the spaces that were absent in our office, all right? And so um, I'm proud to say that the office now better reflects the community that we serve. We've hired people, African-American people, males and females, uh, Latinos, males and females. Um, we've hired people of Asian background, Chinese, Korean, um, Indian, Middle Eastern. Uh, we've hired people that are openly gay. Uh, so we have, we have been purposely drawing in a more diverse uh, office. Um, and by doing that, what we're doing is when we make decisions, we make decisions about the liberty of individuals, about people's justice. And now those decisions can be informed by the voices that were in the space that were absent prior to that point in time. And that is really critical when reaching and trying to design, design and craft and create and curate a space where equity is your goal, right? Equity in terms of access, equity in analysis and understanding, um, and, and you know, just making sure that everyone in this space, their voice is heard, understood, and reflected in what justice looks like in Howard County. Wow, <laughs> thank you. Mm -hmm. I saw you recently speak um, to young people in the county, and I had a couple of young people indicate to me just how moved they were about the work that you're doing and that they had never thought about being a prosecutor until they actually had spoken to you. So that you. says thank amazing you. things about the work that you're doing in the community, so thank you thank for you. that. Thank you. Kiana, I wanna bring you into this. <laughs> um, if you can share with us what you see this year, what is the most prominent human rights violation that is concerned for those within the LGBTQ plus community? 
transgender people. Bathroom ban, not playing sports with um, their preferred peers. Um, there's a lot of misinformation and just general accent. Um, transgender people are comfortable, like, don't always want to transition, uh, and some would like more comfortable, like, being referred to by their preferred pronouns, except it in terms of like how they prefer to dress, for example. So let me ask you this, what would you see as um, someone needing to do to get involved, if they want to get involved? Well, they can reach out to, um, to PFLAG. Um, there are groups at, um, at schools. Um, neighbors, like, or, like in terms of like, are they be LGBTQ themselves, allies, and resourceful reading, well-researched, peer-reviewed um, resources about um, where they can learn more. Contact, it's PFLAG, Howard County, correct, that mm -hmm. they can contact? Yep. Okay, sounds great. Thank you very much for that information. I was gonna, you know, just applaud where Kiana was going, right? And, yes. and the self, self-awareness that we all have to have even before you can get to PFLAG. At the beginning, I did bring up I am on the autism spectrum. Um, and I guess when I say growing up, I had a lot of support, especially in elementary school about, um, I guess, um, help in terms of being, like when it comes to like reading, speaking well, and just how to process information. And while it was able to get through school because it, uh, to me it was more structured, when I graduated, especially through college, I'm finding that uh, jobs is complicated. For example, the professional area. Um, I re, I, let's see, I can't, I've been noticing that entry level, for example, I'm probably not the only one who, I, who made, who felt like, wow, I really should have done this back in, how was I supposed to know to do this back in high school or community college or college? So would you say mm -hmm. that there, you find that there are limited mm -hmm. opportunities um, for individuals that are on the autism mm -hmm. spectrum? Well, this is only speaking for me because everyone is different. Okay. Um, and with different lived experiences, but I'm kind of finding it, especially in the field that I'm in, that I want to go into, which is, uh, well, apparently I, apparently to get into a more, uh, what was it, more defined, such as like analytics or um, one that was more specific, such as environmental, let's say health, for example, just thrown out there. I guess mm -hmm. Kiana brings up is important, and um, I don't think it's just unique, um, but I think exemplified by persons with disabilities and marginalized that mm -hmm. opportunities matter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there are some people in our society, and in Howard County, we know, I mean, I'm, I, my children were privileged mm -hmm. by the fact that uh, two working parents in relatively high paying jobs, held in high esteem, mm -hmm. nice house. Um, not everyone, so, they're, and they're reminded they were privileged, but it did, didn't exclude them from, from that factor. Mm -hmm. But there are other persons for a variety of different reasons that don't have that opportunity perhaps to join that travel club, right? That parents who have weekends mm -hmm. off that can right. do that. Mm -hmm. That that had factors where they couldn't do the eighth research paper um, right. or AP course right. or internship or whatever, so, and I think that's critical. And Rich Rick, Rich talked about that in hiring, right? Mm -hmm. Looking at the diverse portfolio mm -hmm. of people and trying to provide opportunities mm -hmm. um, for everyone in the workplace. Obviously, hiring the best, right. but sometimes it means taking a different lens at what is best mm -hmm. um, and we have to collectively do a better job of that um, if we are going to have the diverse workforce uh, that I think we need um, 
to create this um, community in Howard County that exemplifies um, the ideals that 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 I think certainly all of us here talked about. And I feel like even for like um, those that are like uh, uh, neurotypical, they probably are also in my shoes in the sense of didn't know what to do. By the time they found out, it's like, oh, wow, I should have worked on getting this experience kind of thing, so. There's like two, there's two points that I want to like touch on mm -hmm. that were raised there. So one is, is creating a space where opportunities are brought to people yeah. so they can kind of explore what they want to do in a more direct fashion. Mm -hmm. um, because it sounds like you're saying, I had to hunt for something and I didn't know what I was hunting for. I didn't know what to look for and it wasn't necessarily, it didn't, it didn't it wasn't immediately accessible to me. So accessibility is always an issue. The other thing I want to touch on is the point that you both make, and I'm in that situation, well, I have three kids. Um, you know, both my wife and I work. And you say, you know, two working families, prestigious jobs, nice house. That's true, but there's different levels of privilege. In, in Howard County in particular, they don't have like, we don't have buses to take kids to sports, right? So unless you have a parent who has incredible flexibility in their job or has the luxury of being at home, you can't engage in, in certain activities. I say sports, but it could be clubs too. So translate that out. What does that mean in terms of opportunities down the road? Colleges and higher edu education institutions are looking at well-rounded students. Right. You can't be well-rounded. Imagine this. Imagine the world, and it's, it certainly is like first world problems, but imagine, <laughs> imagine a world where both my parents have great jobs and have to work and, and because of that, I don't have access to make myself more well-rounded, and so I'm not gonna get some of those opportunities because I don't have the luxury of having either a nanny or someone to stay at home to shuttle me back and forth from the clubs that would make me well-rounded, that would make me an attractive student in the first place to these higher education institutions. And so you have like a cycle mm -hmm. And again, it's, it's first world problems. There are certainly people struggling with far less, but there are real problems. But they are real problems. And they are human, they are, they are, they are human rights issues because you're denying the full potential of our children. If that's not a human right, then what is? Right. Like, you're trying to grow people to basically self-actualize, to meet their maximum potential, and, we're, and they're denied that because both parents have to work. Right. And Rich, to even take it further, what COVID show, showed us too was not everybody has this. Right. Not everyone has this computer. We went virtual. Yes. yes. Um, and yes, the schools did their best to provide it, but even still, how to use it? Mm -hmm. How to use it? Do you have internet, access to internet? And so a lot of people were cut off. Mm -hmm. um, their learning abilities, their ability to have access to, you know, meetings and clubs that mm -hmm. went virtually, like that showed us where we were with the technology divide as well. Mm -hmm. um, and we still have a huge gap and, and it is a problem. But two things that out of the conversation, one thing, our office, and we see it in our office, um, complaints of discrimination against um, individuals with disabilities, whether or not we see it quite commonly in employment cases and housing. Um, and so it is truly an issue in our community. Our community is not um, absolved of this issue. And so there is more that we do need to do. but. When Kiana brought up the internship program, it made me think, do either of you and your offices have an internship program? And if so, can you just talk a little bit about it? Yes, Dr. Russian, go first. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so we have, uh, we have volunteers. We have high school volunteers. It could be college uh, and graduate students that, um, I don't know if we formally call it intern, um, but uh, either observe. Again, it's based on their interest and what they're able to do. Um, COVID, I'm going to admit, has been quite challenging in doing that one for the safety reasons of uh, having people on the, in the workplace um, and then also, you know, the time to do that. But yeah, I, I, I was, after the meeting, I was going to just explore a little bit more of what Kiana's interests were. I heard a little bit that maybe something that, that we can work on, so. And then for our attorney's office, yes, we have interns. Um, we have two different, well, three different, really, but truly two different tiers of interns. Mm -hmm. So you have uh, uh, the three tiers are high school students, very few, very selective, 
um, handful. We have uh, undergrad students, again, smaller portion, but, but a little bit larger than the high school. And then we have law students who can actually do um, more of the actual legal work. They can help, okay. they can help, and it helps them too because they get a chance to like write a motion, which then is a writing sample, which can then help them get a job down the road. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the, the students that are interns with us come in and they get a chance to see uh, the life cycle of cases, mm -hmm. investigations, um, they obviously have to sign, have to background check, they have to, be, right. they have to meet their criteria, right? But they get a chance to see what, what we do from the inside and our prosecutor's office, everything we do is in secret. We move in secret, generally speaking, we're doing investigations mm -hmm. for a whole host of reasons. Right. And so they have access to understand that process and the interface with police and federal law enforcement and the community. Um, you can find out about that at www at howardcountysao.org again www.howardcountysao.org is our website and uh, there's a link where you can apply excellent you knew I was going to ask so, mm -hmm. so thank you and Dr. Rossman where would someone contact if they were interested and I know there's still a challenge for safety reasons but yeah you could go to um, our website um, howardcountyhealth.org um, and there's also an ask health uh, that you should be able to find on the website okay Thank you for that. And so just to go back to some advice, maybe that people that are watching this may want from you. Can you share, you know, if they're sitting at home and they're saying, I want to do something, but I don't know what to do. Each of you come from different walks of life, different um, fields, professional fields. If you can share what you suggest someone do if they're interested in being involved in social change? I'll, I'll start. Um, one, I applaud because if you're listening now, you've sat through about an hour <laughs> of this conversation, which I think means that you're self-reflecting or at minimally interested in the topic and what to do. So I think self-reflection and self-awareness is the first part of discovery uh, and then seeking what else can I do. So I, I'll give you an example. Um, you know, I, I consider myself pretty self-aware and hip mm -hmm. and, yes, human rights oriented. <laughs> do your kids think you're hip? We won't ask okay. them. Okay. <laughs> but go ahead. I'm sorry. And don't ask the staff, you know. Okay. Right now. Um, but um, several years ago, um, as part of work, we had someone uh, come from Chase Brexton, who an uh, LGBTQ uh, healthcare worker and produced our intake forms. And you know, you mark off your name, male, female, and she said, this is a problem. You just have male, female. You have no other choices. And it really took, it took me aback, and I thought, well, yeah, because you're born male, male female. And, and again, it, I, it had to cause me, it probably took her like 20 minutes right. for my brain really to switch over that there's other choices there, or there should be other choices there. Um, and I could give you other examples. And, and so just, again, by listening to this conversation, by opening yourself up to others who may be different or you think are different than you, um, I think is that first step. Um, and I'll let the others add, add their opinions. So I, from, a, from, a, from a prosecutorial public safety perspective, if you see something wrong, don't just watch, right? Get involved. If you, if you feel there's some change that needs to be made in your community, make it, right? Like be the change you seek, right? Like don't just sit there and watch. Um, from a criminal perspective, from a crime perspective, if, if someone's being harmed, take steps to address that harm, whether it be documenting it, whether it be calling 911, come to that person's aid, help, right? Um, when it's, if it's about organizations and, and you want it, you're passionate about some particular group and you want to find out how to support them, social media is a lot of bad things. There's a lot of horrible things associated with it, but there's also a lot of good. Right? You can crowdsource financially, you can crowdsource energy um, and, and time via, via social media. So there's organizations out there, if you just search on Facebook, Twitter, you, know, you can search these things out and get information. We live in an age, contrary to the past, where information was, was harder to discern and get access to, you now can find all kinds of information. Not all of it's accurate, not all of it's valid, but you can find it and do the sifting for yourself, right? And then if something speaks to you, go out and be an advocate for it. 
right? So about the for social change. Um, before uh, the start of the panel, I brought up mutual aid, and examples of mutual aid would be, say, a food pantry or uh, a toy drive since the holidays are coming around. And other examples that have been going on of, well, food and other items being distributed was the was a group called the Columbia Community Care. I guess you want to learn more information about mutual aid. There is a site called Mutual Aid Hub that you can look up to see like ones across the country. So that's an example of community, the community coming together and helping each other out. Um, other example, I guess, um, I mentioned in the previous ones about um, reaching out to other people um, to lis listen and learn from them how to be allies, say, to the LGBTQA, Blacks, or other um, Asians, and how they can help, as well as, say, I guess, uh, spread more awareness on social media about the goings-on of the community, for example. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, State's Attorney Gibson, Dr. Rossman, Kiana, thank you so much for participating in today's panel. I think that this conversation was much needed, and as I start, said at the beginning, I think we can continue here all day and have conversations and try to figure out solutions to change. Um, but I think this was a start, and hopefully that you have inspired people that are watching. Um, I know that I'm inspired from just watching what each of you are doing and how you are making a difference. So I thank you. I thank you from the community and I thank you from our perspective in the Office of Human Rights and Equity because I feel like we're not alone. We, that you all are doing the good fight as well. Um, so thank you for that. And just in closing, and some of these things came out in our conversations. But inequities, racism, discrimination, limited access to health care, um, targeting and intolerance, that exists. That exists in our community. It exists in the community at large. And, but the thing that we want everyone to understand, and I think that each of you are communicating as well, is that it's not just a limited amount of people's fight. It's all of our fight and all of us to get involved. And I found this quote, and I heard the quote before from uh, Mother Teresa that I alone can't change the world. I can cast a stone across the waters to create many ripples. And I think we look at the huge problems of our world and we're like, I'm just one person. But in fact, if we all come together, and I would just encourage everyone today and beyond, find your advocacy voice. Your voice may not be Dr. Rossman's voice, State's Attorney Gibson, Kiana's voice, but find your voice and get involved and take action. Um, we all have a part in building this world and making it better. And we want to make sure that this world is a place where everyone can live, thrive, be shown respect, feel that they have dignity, understanding, and honestly, to have opportunities, we talked about that, to have opportunities to be successful. So today, I appreciate again you all celebrating International Human Rights Day with us. And thank you to the audience for sharing your afternoon with us. So thank you. <laughs>